Welcome and thank you all so much for coming tonight's, to tonight's Foreign Policy Association, David Coulter, Warburg Pincus LLC Lecture Series on Africa. It's part of two Africa events this uh, month with Foreign Policy Association, including one on March 27th, uh, a screening of When China Met Africa. And I'm Jake Bright, Foreign Policy Association Whitehead Fellow, focusing on African business and finance. And on behalf of the Foreign Policy Association, we'd like to welcome our moderator, Ali Velshi, and our panelists, Teresa Clark, Tony Elamelu, and Ambassador Joseph Wilson. And I'll hand over in a moment for Ali to say more about our, our panelists. But it's first important to thank our host at Credit Suisse, Doug Paul, who is a Foreign Policy Association board member. And finally, we need to thank uh, Foreign Policy Association President Noel Latif, who luckily for all of us um, gave Robert Nolan and I the green light to do this panel when we started pitching it, uh, I think last year. It's been a while. So tonight the topic is Africa, emerging trade and investment and opportunity across the continent. And it brings up the broader question of what's happening in Africa in terms of business and markets. Why are global CEOs uh, choosing this as a priority topic? Why are global business thought leaders like McKinsey, Bain, uh, Accenture, Ernst & Young doing major reports on Africa as a new emerging market? And the broader question from there is, is there something that's going on in African business that could intersect with other things socially and politically that could transform the continent? So I recently did an article uh, trying to address those questions for Foreign Policy Association. And I'm honored that tonight we have a distinguished moderator and speakers to address those questions in depth. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ali and our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jake. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of people, many of you may be very familiar with what's going on in Africa economically and politically. Uh, right now. There are many who aren't. That's always the part that fascinates me. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not new to us at CNN. We, uh, we put quite a bit into, uh, into coverage out of Africa, particularly on the, uh, on the business and economic <laughs> side, uh, because it really is truly a, a remarkable growth story. As the world starts to repair itself economically, um, it, it, it's still a standout. Uh, some of the growth numbers uh, and estimates that you've seen for 2012 are, are quite phenomenal. Some of the actual growth in 2011 all the way back to, to 2008 when, when everything else was, was so rapidly slowing, Africa continued to grow. And by the way, that's not a new phenomenon. However, we got a bit of a late start today, so uh, since we have to stay on schedule, the most important thing is to cut something out of the, the agenda, and that's going to be me. Uh, so. <laughs> While I have lots to say about Africa, I, I was born in Africa. My parents were, my grandparents were. Uh, I'm, I'm in Africa quite regularly, uh, and I cover it. Uh, but I, I want to sort of hand this over to our, our panel uh, and then to you for your questions of them. So I want to I get started. We've got three great guests here, who three great panelists who really uh, know a lot about Africa, but they know about different things. Uh, and I want to start off with Teresa Clark. She's the chairman and CEO of Africa.com's former managing director uh, at Goldman Sachs. And then I'm going to go over to Tony and, and then to uh, Ambassador Joe Wilson uh, to get their take on, on some specifics about business and politics in Africa. But Teresa, let's start with you. Uh, give us the big picture uh, as you see it on Africa. Yeah, I'd like to sort of address a point that you made, which is that a lot of people still don't know how we got to this point. And just look over the last few years to see how we got here, because Africa has not been an investment destination in the eyes of Americans for very long. And I think the first thing that came to mind in terms of what got Americans focused on Africa as something other than a destination for charity was in 2006 when the Council on Foreign Relations did a report on Africa that said you need to pay attention. Now this was a bridge in some regards because they weren't saying pay attention from an investment standpoint but they did point out three very strategic reasons to pay attention to Africa that were different from our reasons previously. And the first was because of the resources, a reason that we've always known that Africa was important. And certainly the Chinese were figuring out how important the resources are in Africa. Secondly, 
was Africa was important strategically from a security standpoint. Um, after 9-11, the fact that there are it's a large Muslim population in many of the northern African countries made Africa a strategic priority for the U.S. in terms of security. And thirdly, because of the global health war on HIV AIDS with Africa being the epicenter, those were the reasons that the CFR said that we must focus. And following on that, in 2007, given where oil prices were and commodity prices, you had U.S. hedge funds investing in Africa to a large degree. But this was hot money. This was money that was in and out there to make a quick buck, take advantage of the high commodity prices. Right. And when the prices came down, they were gone. 2008, we had the financial crisis, and I think there was a flight to safety. And so everything just sort of stood still. People backed out. They weren't in Africa. No one knew what they were doing. They were just trying to keep their heads above water. 2009 continued through. And 2010 was really the year that I see the tide having turned for Africa as an investment destination. It started in the spring when, as Jake mentioned in his remarks, uh, McKinsey published their first report on Africa. And this for the first time, having McKinsey speak to Fortune 500 CEOs and say, Africa, place of growth for investment. This was new. No one had heard that before. Then you had the World Cup that June and July, and that gave people a visual to associate with that. In August of 2010, Barron's ran as their cover story, Africa, the next, bis the next big investment destination. No Western financial media had put Africa on the front cover in that regard before. And then in the third week of September of 2010, when you had the UN General Assembly meeting in New York and the Clinton Global Initiative meeting in New York and the Millennium Challenge Corporation meeting in New York, during that week there were five very significant corporate announcements that I think really put the seal on it. That week, Coca-Cola came out and said that Africa was going to be their biggest growth market going forward. You had the Ford Motor Company report on its most recent quarter, and they said that Africa had been their most profitable region in the last quarter. The Harvard University Endowment uh, disclosed the, its portfolio and al its allocations in South Africa um, on their ETF portfolio, rated fourth globally in terms of the countries where they were exposed. You then had IBM come out with a huge announcement about a billion and a half dollar deal that they were doing in East Africa with Barty Airtel. And the week was capped off with Walmart announcing their investment into MassMart in a deal um, valued at $4 billion. And that really is when I think the corporate world in America woke up to the fact that Africa is an investment destination. And since that time, Fortune 500 boards have asked their CEOs, what is our Africa policy, and if we don't have one, our strategy, if we don't have one, we need to get one. Is, is it uh, something that can be simply adopted by companies? Is there a logical Africa strategy? Is there a way to get into it uh, because you're realizing all of these things? Other companies have done it. People have written about it. The growth rates are much higher than they are in much of the rest of the world. Or does every, country, every company have to look at this uh, organically and, and separately? Absolutely. Every company needs to look, as I think you would probably, you have a leading question, every company needs to look at it separately. And I think that you know, we still haven't gotten to really where we should be. If you take a look at flows of foreign direct investment for emerging markets around the world, whether it's Brazil, mm -hmm. Russia, India, or China, the U.S. is always the largest foreign investor into these emerging markets. And if you look at those flows, the only region of the world where the U.S. doesn't lead is into Africa. And so even the investment from Brazil into Africa exceeds the FDI from the U.S. into Africa. Right. So there's still a long way for us to go. And obviously China, a big player, we'll talk about that. Tony, um, where Teresa's talking about foreign direct investment, which is always a sign of uh, a success and, and the fact that, that people are paying attention, the other element of organic GDP growth in, in Africa, organic economic growth, is that there has been inter-African trade. There have been remarkable achievements in some places, for instance, in, in parts of Africa where it used to be just really onerous to, to get through borders with goods or as a tourist. Uh, but inter-African trade, the idea that African nations are leaning on the technologies and businesses of other African nations, give us a sense of that. No, first, is, um, I'd like to make two points before I address this, uh, your issue. The fact that we're sitting here today discussing Africa, to me, is a good uh, signaling. It shows that Africa is truly, or the world, especially the U.S., is truly beginning to accord Africa the kind of uh, importance I think it should be accorded at a time like this. Uh, Africa do, uh, does hold a lot of potentials for 
investors, American investors in particular, who want to come to Africa. Uh, China is taking advantage of that, and at times we hear people criticize China, but some of us feel, why criticize China? What others didn't see China is going to see those, uh, those potentials in Africa. Second point I want to make is that um, today's Africa is different from Africa of 20 years ago. But it seems to me that the United States in particular has not come to realization of the new Africa. And so what has changed about Africa that we see today? In terms of, I call it the soft infrastructure in Africa. You have democracy in Africa now better than it was before. And democracy to me is the superstructure upon which, on the foundation upon which the superstructure is built. It's very stable now. Almost all African countries are now democratic, just a few, one or two left. Uh, also, you have better governance, corporate governance and civil governance in Africa today. And you have population, you have the GDP is growing, so income per capita is actually improving. And Africa has become a very strong market. Less than 50% of uh, African uh, population is uh, below two, uh, the age of 30, so it's a huge market for consumer, consumer goods. But coming to the point about trade, intra-Africa trade, you know, I see from a different perspective you only trade when you have what to trade, commodity, finished products, so to speak. The kind of products that Africa has, some most African countries at this point in time, and that is actually where there's also opportunity for investors, is actually in raw form, raw materials, commodities, etc. And so African countries' economies do not have the, pot the potentials or the capability to process this, these raw materials. So the raw materials will naturally find its destination offshore, ex-Africa to Europe, to America, to China, to be processed and brought back to Africa. So we can indeed hold conferences and say a lot about uh, intra-Africa trade. Not much can actually happen until we begin to have the capability to process some of these raw materials in Africa. It is only when you process them that you can actually trade intra-Africa. Take, for instance, petroleum product. My country, Nigeria, is a major importer of, um, producer of petroleum, the biggest in Africa. But Nigeria even imports petroleum products. And so if Nigeria produces petroleum, what would Nigeria say and export it to Europe, America, China, they process and bring the finished products back to Nigeria. You cannot expect Nigeria to trade much with other countries. We can only do that if we begin to process some of these raw materials. And therein lies huge opportunities for investors in this part of the world who actually can take advantage of the abundance of natural resources in Africa, set up processing plants, either alone or in conjunction with rising African entrepreneurs, process, and the market is huge. And then we'll begin to talk of uh, intra-Africa trade. So that's how I feel about this. That leads very well into uh, what uh, Ambassador Joe Wilson deals with. You've, you've really been very involved in, in infrastructure, uh, and particularly on the energy side in Africa. Obviously, as things get better, when you look at these, these growth rates in Africa, that automatically means an increase in energy consumption uh, and, and an increase in, in the ability to try and process more of this energy in Africa, and in some cases, there, there's no other choice. You can't be processing electricity somewhere else. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm certainly glad to be um, up here talking about Africa and actually having somebody listen. Uh, I've been talking about <laughs> Africa since 1976 when I first joined the Foreign Service. I would point out that there are any number of things that the United States government took the lead on in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to create the conditions for today's Africa including once we decided that human rights and democracy and human rights uh, were actually important to us and that Africa was a place to advance those issues, uh, we actually started seeing Africa, African governments reform themselves. Uh, as we saw generations actually getting educated, and in particular I would say the communications, the telecommunications revolution in the, in the mid-90s, bringing uh, cell phones really into every village, was when you, you really started to begin to see things move. And um, the fact that you've got, right, right next to me, a hugely successful international businessman um, who comes from Nigeria um, and is not, didn't make his fortune uh, sending out notices saying, if you send me your bank account number, <laughs> I'll send you $15 million, is a credit to the maturing of the continent itself. And I say that with great affection because he is one of our partners in our endeavors.
And Symbian Power is essentially a power construction company uh, that follows the U.S. government into conflict zones and into other difficult places. So we followed uh, the U.S. government, the U.S. military in particular, into Iraq. Uh, did 10 projects in Iraq, including stringing transmission lines all across Al Anbar province during the heart of the violence and there, and including building two substations in, in um, Sadr City, uh, one of which was used by the U.S. military as a forward operating base for a while when there was violence there. We went, then went to Afghanistan to build a power plant, <clears throat> and then we heard that the Millennium Challenge Corporation was going to do some infrastructure, um, was going to sign a compact with Tanzania. We thought after what we've been through, going to Tanzania is going to be a piece of cake in terms of operating there. And, it, and, it, and it's not a piece of cake. But it is certainly not such a hostile environment as it might have been just a generation ago, where you had very few rules of engagement and where the former colonial power uh, had a certain monopoly on these trade relationships. So it certainly has opened up in that. We are now managing about $130 million worth of construction projects in Tanzania, all in the power sector. And we are also the proud owners of uh, 211 megawatts of power generating uh, equipment. And we are very soon to uh, do an agreement for about, I think it's a total of 611 megawatts to be installed by the end of 2013. So we're suddenly big stakeholders in Tanzania. And we found the business model of competing for contracts with the Millennium Challenge Corporation or some other US government agency is a good way to go in uh, that construction line of business uh, gets us um, uh, into the country uh, from which we can then explore other opportunities in the sector. Uh, we are currently in Nigeria. We're bidding on a couple of distribution companies, and we're bidding on a power generating company as a technical partner. Uh, and we will soon, because there's been a compact signed with the uh, government of Ghana, we expect to try and, and do this again in Ghana. And let me just, I, I actually had to bone up on this, some of the subject matter. I don't read a lot of macroeconomics anymore. We have young guys and good eyes and strong minds who do that. <laughs> but I did, I did take, some, um, take some notes of the McKinsey uh, uh, um, study. Um, and I, I thought the one that, that really made a lot of sense is if you want to invest in Africa, some of the things that you really ought to, ought to have in, in, your, in your organization. You ought to arrive early and take the long view. I can, I, I, that rings true for me because it's been almost 40 years since I first arrived on the continent. <laughs> Build relationships as in any other country. Relationships are really important. Africa, where bureaucracies are still really weak, it's, it's getting to know people and having that bond of trust with them that gets things done. And it's a very, very personal way of doing business. And that, that also made a lot of sense and certainly something I learned in my diplomatic career. Be vigilant. If you, uh, if you count the pennies, the dollars will come by themselves. Active management, you really do. I, I started my career as a general services officer. And uh, actively managing resources and personnel is absolutely critical. And uh, a, a diversified project portfolio, which is common sense for any investor. So that came out of the McKinsey. I will give them credit for it. But I think those are very common sense. And those are exactly the five things, the five attributes that I would want if I were, if, if, uh, as I do want, as an investor um, in Africa and as a partner to Africa. Finally, I would just say this. Um, um, the, the maturity of African relationships, trading relationships, commercial relationships, investment relationships, is at least as much a product of the maturity of Africans in a modern world as it is of anything else. And um, it's easy to sort of say, well, we brought this to you, but Africans really brought themselves to the table in a very big way. Um, it's great fun. It's a great pleasure. Um, and uh, I commend Africa to everybody, not just as a tourist destination, but as an investment destination. Well said, Joe. And as much as I, 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 I think notwithstanding your commitment to arriving early and taking the long view, uh, <laughs> that others, you know, and I think it's an interesting discussion topic, get your questions ready, uh, might think that China had, had done that. But we'll, we'll talk about that. And, you know, uh, Teresa, you talked about the, the World Cup. I was there, uh, I wasn't reporting for CNN, I was actually there okay. enjoying the I World Cup. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'd been married some months earlier and I hadn't stopped traveling because I never do. And, and uh, my wife had said, 
the honeymoon can be anything that is not paid for by CNN and not attached to any coverage. So um, I booked the World Cup. <laughs> it wasn't what she had in mind. Uh, but she got into it and she enjoyed it. And of course, because I was at the, the final game, uh, CNN had a man managed to get me on the phone and talk about it. And you know, the Africans had been disappointed after Ghana, and there, there was, you know, South Africa was never particularly strong as a competitor. But, but the only overwhelming sense at the end of those games was that Africa won. Yeah. Um, for a couple reasons. It, 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 it executed flawlessly the whole issue of crime in South Africa. I mean, Africa really did, did have this fantastic stage. Um, that said, uh, when doing business in a country, the way we measure it is we look at two main things. One is the rule of law, because if you want to go somewhere and do business, you've got to trust that there is a rule of law. And the second one is the ability to trade very well. And generally speaking, the, the, the countries that come up best in Africa at the moment are South Africa. Ghana does very well. Um, Tony, do you think we African countries, you talked about the, the bureaucracy issues, uh, Ambassador, do you think African countries have gone far enough and who do you hold up as examples of places that are welcoming to inter-Africa trade and uh, foreign direct investment? I think um, African countries have uh, tremendously improved. I think it's on record the 10th uh, most uh, friendly country for doing business, is World Bank report on ease of doing business in Rwanda, and Rwanda started not long ago. Most African countries, there's a kind of peer competition right now, trying to improve on the, on the doing business uh, rating. In fact, uh, some of us, the Tony Elumelu Foundation, which I founded, uh, and Teresa is on the advisory board, is uh, spearheading what we call the competitiveness uh, uh, efforts in Africa, trying to get African countries to become more competitive, open up their countries, and get more competitive trying to let African leadership and leaders know that there's a connection between your ability to attract investment to your country and your ability to meet the desire of creating employment and economic development. So what I'd like to say is, for Africa today, quite a number of countries have tremendously improved. Even in Nigeria, there's been tremendous improvement in ease of doing business and competitiveness. And uh, Nigerian government just created Minister of Trade and Investment and the agenda for Ministry of Trade and Investment is to move Nigeria from 119th position to 30th position in two years. Mm -hmm. So even a realization, the awareness of all of this in Africa is improving. Right now, before, to clear goods at Nigerian port would take about, uh, about 30 to 60 days. But right now, right now, they've achieved seven days. And the target okay. is to achieve 48 days, 48 hours. So there's, there's uh, in, on ease of doing business rating, uh, African countries are improving. Ghana is doing well, Rwanda is doing well, uh, Botswana is doing very well, South Africa is doing well. So we see a lot of countries coming, coming in. And in fact, uh, I think that the peer review mechanism that the African leaders have also has helped to create further awareness in this, uh, in this area. Rwanda, you know, I was in Rwanda for the first time in December, and uh, I was in Nairobi before that, and everybody kept on saying, you're going to love Kigali. It's so organized and it's so clean. And I was thinking to myself, having somebody in Nairobi tell you that is of no consequence. I mean, everything in the world is clean and organized compared to Nairobi. No offense to the Kenyans. It's my birthplace. I love the country. I love the city. But, it, but Nairobi's a bit chaotic. Uh, Kigali is a remarkable organized place. They've, they've really got a good handle on corruption, or at least they're trying to. Uh, I hope that works for them. When it comes to being competitive, Teresa, uh, the Chinese are there. Have they, have they taken all the low-hanging fruit? No, there's a lot of fruit. <laughs> so um, <laughs> they've taken the first fruit, yeah. um, not the low, only low-hanging fruit. But I think you know, the, the question of Chinese is, is always a big issue in discussions like this. And I always feel a little bit uncomfortable addressing the topic because I think that we as Americans and American government in particular you know, have criticized the Chinese because they don't impose the same kind of restrictions uh, regarding human rights and they don't make their investments conditioned on achieving certain policy objectives that Americans do. Um, but I think that it's up to the Africans to decide what those policies are. And frankly, as I pointed out in my earlier remarks, because the Americans really have not been there as private sector investors, I think we have even less of a seat at the table to opine on those matters. Of course, I support 
human rights and all of the the advancements from a social development perspective that I think everyone in this room would support. But I think that it really is for the Africans to decide. And I think that there's something about someone who shows up with real money, builds you roads, builds you infrastructure. You know, you got to look at that and say there's something good. I mean, I, I saw one statistic that looked at all of the U.S. aid that has been donated to Africa over the last, you know, sort of 40 years. And that, it, that number exceeds what the Chinese have invested in the last 10. And yet you have to say, what did we really accomplish with the money that we gave versus what the Chinese have accomplished? It's quite visible um, what they've yeah. achieved. Because Joe, when we were talking about the- Can the, I comment the, on the, this? Go ahead, Tony. I think uh, Theresa and I usually have the same viewpoint, but you know, the point about Africa is not how much has gone into Africa by what age, for instance. It is how productive that money mm -hmm. has been. You know, in the Chinese, I would say, have been extremely productive in the way they have deployed their money, mm -hmm. the investment in Africa. And, you know, they don't just come and say to Africa, this is what you must do. They ask African leaders and people, what are your priorities? And they key into your priorities. And I think that's a new paradigm that we need to begin to preach here. Well, it certainly made it into, into mm -hmm. popular discourse where in African cities, when I'm asking about the economy, people refer to the Chinese hotel and the Chinese highways and the Chinese shops and the Chinese shopping centers and things like that, Joe. Yeah, but what they also refer to is how many Chinese are there and how they're not creating any jobs that the Africans can take except for maybe night watchmen. And you're seeing some backlash in a number of African countries, including Mozambique, and I think Angola's passed it now, that restricts really the number of, of uh, expatriates the Chinese can, can go in because they don't leave. They go in under, they, they used to anyway, they used to go in as a development project and then they would stay and bid on World Bank and other, other internationally financed projects. They go in and build a stadium. You know, one more second. Yeah, get your questions ready. <laughs> go ahead. I, th I think this is a bit debatable because, uh, you know, some countries in Africa have a um, shortage of manpower, skilled manpower, artisans, you know, and you have in some of these places Chinese coming and they socialize and work with African uh, laborers. And by so doing, they also transfer technology and knowledge. And so it's arguable that uh, they actually don't create employment. They are also come in to help improve local skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll uh, keep an eye out for everybody, but let's start with you, sir. Just identify yourself. Aful Singh, I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Fair Observer, a new journal to analyze global issues. I've just flown in from California, and I'm suitably underdressed for the occasion. <laughs> as one we welcome all here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I, my question to the whole panel and, uh, is this, that what you're seeing perhaps in Africa is a reversion to historical mean. Uh, the trading relationships between Africa and, let's say, India, uh, tests, as a testimony to your origin, uh, were extremely deep and strong. And Vasco da Gama was shepherded to India through a Gujarati sea pilot. And the European uh, intervention is just, and subsequently American intervention is just a couple of centuries old, which is nothing, which is, I mean, coming from where I come from with a you know, long sense of history, which is India. So what you're seeing is, A, change in economic power in the world, B, more hunger amongst Indian and Chinese entrepreneurs, particularly the Chinese for now. Vedant is there. Vedant is doing extremely well, um, which is listed in the London uh, Stock Exchange. And what you're seeing is this huge, the, the second wave of the kind of Gujarati entrepreneurs that settled on the East Coast. And it is only natural that uh, that synergy will continue. And, and fear-mongering about it is, is not the way forward. Uh, what do you have to say to that? Interesting. Uh, I think, uh, let, me, <laughs> let me say that uh, you actually captured, I am totally aligned with you. Let me just add a bit that um, beyond historical facts, I think you know, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, I think they have a better understanding of the way of doing business in developing economies. Mm. They, you know, they have long-term perspectives. They do not have certain stereotypes. They do not see every African business, for instance, as being one that is uh, leading with corruption. They, they look at, they don't see everyone in the same light. They look at institutions case by case. 
the telecommunications industry in Africa to a large extent is, uh, is dominated by, by, by India-China group. And, and you ask yourself, I know, for instance, some countries, when they wanted to start uh, the GSM revolution, the Western telecommunication companies were not interested mm -hmm. in coming in. Today, they all want to, to come to Africa, to, but they are coming very late. But you have uh, others uh, from China and uh, India that took advantage. So the message for me, from what you said, uh, for, for me to the rest of the world is, the people, business executives, corporate leaders, political leaders who formulate policies should begin to acquaint themselves, I guess that's why we're here too, with uh, modern and current realities about uh, Africa, what it takes to do business, knowing that Africa of today is different from Africa of 10, 20 years ago. Things have changed. Rule of law in Africa today. Mm -hmm. Governance is improving. You know, corruption is not as high as it used to be before. Democracy in Africa, people are looking at things fairly differently, and institutions are being built every day. So things are changing, and the world needs to know this. Very good. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Yusufzai. I'm with IBM, actually. Very happy to see them cited in this big, nifty fact sheet. So um, as you can see in the fact sheet, um, with this big part of the Airtel deal that IBM's done, um, frankly, we cannot find a certain qualified talent fast enough, and I'd love the panel to address that. We're just finding that the university pipeline, especially for IT professionals and or experienced hires who you really have to pay a ridiculous premium for. In fact, I was working with IBM in India the past three and a half years in Bangalore, and we had a ridiculous kind of war for talent there, and it, we're starting to see that here. So I'd love for the panel to um, talk about that. I just, I just came back from South by Southwest, and uh, all those startup companies that were looking for investors, at the end of every sentence they were asking, does anybody know a developer? I mean, they, they just couldn't get enough people. So this is, I guess this is the one piece of free trade in the world everybody's yeah, looking for, for yeah. IT uh, talent. Yeah. Well, I'll start since we were in the IT space. And certainly in Kenya, I think in part of the problem is that there are so many opportunities from an entrepreneurial standpoint that you see young entrepreneurs starting their own, compa their own companies. Um, Kenya really has become the Silicon Valley sure. to Africa. And so a lot of innovation is coming out of Kenya. We look at Kenya as a source for uh, whatever is new and creative and long-term solutions in the IT space, where you look at the proliferation of M-Pesa, you look at um, a really neat application that's recently come out of Kenya called iCal, which helps farmers be more productive with their, it's, an, it's a mobile app that you can use on any phone, and it helps farmers um, make their cows more productive. And M-Pesa is a money transfer. And M-Pesa is mobile money, mobile money transfer, which has, eclipsed the amount of capital moving throughout the banking system. Unbelievable. Um, and so these are, so, and Ushahidi, um, yeah, which came out of um, Kenya, is also another form of innovation. So while I know it's hard to find people, I think it's all relative, as we've talked about here. You know, it's not just an absolute question. I think we also have the same challenges here in New York, frankly. I'm looking for some developers, so if you know any, you know, send them <laughs> our way. Um, but I'd also, the last point I'd make is that I think it's also different from some time ago because there's so many more opportunities in Africa than there were 10 years ago. And we're very encouraged to see the number of expatriates who are educated and trained in the West moving back home. And we're encouraged by that. And the U.S. government is helping you with that. Yes, they in, are. Uh, in not giving people the visas. Yes, they that they Can I just uh, add from, from <laughs> our business is pretty much of a low tech business, but we have a, we, so one of the ways that we compete is we have, um, we hire a lot locally and we have a training site. And we, we actually um, are a partnership with the Northwest Linesman College. So when they get out of the training, we bring their trainers over, train the trainers, take them back, and we train, we have classes. And so um, everybody graduates with a linesman certificate from the Northwest Linesman College that if they get a visa to come to the States, they're qualified to work wow. um, on, on American transmission and distribution lines. We also trained the first um, female uh, linesman in Tanzania who uh, was brought, we brought down to Dar es Salaam to meet Secretary Clinton when she was down there, which was a big source of pride for us. Right in the back there, sir. <clears throat> I'm trying to keep track of everybody. A lot of questions here. Yes, hello. My name is Benny Angelo. I'm currently with Exxon Advisors. My background is in financial services and consulting. Um, I have two questions. I'll make them um, My first question is, we're talking, we've touched on the issue of infrastructure and that being a barrier to entry in the most African countries. Um, my familiarity is with Nigeria. 
right? And that's a complicated, you know, country in general. What do you kind of, what do you, where do you view the, the use of public private partnerships towards improving the infrastructure, whether that's building a bridge, we're talking about, you know, helping with the uh, power grid, et cetera. Do you, do you got, as a panel in general, you lean one way versus the other? And uh, my second point is, I'm familiar with the uh, Tony Lumenu Foundation, and um, I think there's a lot of great things coming out of that just because people like myself always mention the idea of, you know, wanting to return, and that gives you almost a way to do that. Um, however, where do we see more foundations like that? Are there more out there that we just don't know about? Or, you know, what do you kind of see as the future for that? Tony, want to start? Okay. I think uh, the two points you raised, the PPP, I think, uh, as you rightly said, it's a way to go. It's one of the ways of getting things done. From our experience, we, we two things. First is uh, with Symbion Power, we're trying to bid for a power generation uh, project that's owned by government, and we have approached government to allow us to uh, produce by 59%, 51% of it, and government will keep 49 and work together to improve uh, power generation in the country. So that is PVP. And just last week or so, we commissioned the first uh, concentrate plant in Nigeria. Uh, it's a PPP arrangement between the health holdings, our, business, our commercial business, and the government of Benue State. The government provided all the infrastructure. Uh, we, we put up the plant there. And now the plant is in production. And hopefully, Nigeria imports uh, juice uh, into uh, concentrate into uh, we import juice concentrate into the country in excess of uh, close to a billion dollars. And that should serve that market in 18 months. But coming back to the second point, so I'm an apostle of PPP, and it's one way to go, one of the ways to actually deal with issue of infrastructure in Africa. The second point you raise about foundation, I call it uh, catalytic uh, philanthropy in Africa today. We have seen an evolution, Africa of uh, foundations in Africa, or NGOs, so to speak, that used to collect money, receive money from donors. Uh, to today, the, a few emerging that are quite different, catalytic, um, we call them Africa funded, Africa funded, Africa funded, and also looking at key catalytic uh, areas that can change things in Africa. We have chosen entrepreneurship, business excellence, and trying to see how we can create a more competitive environment for private sector to actually lead the way in economic development in Africa. So a few more are coming, but uh, I think we all have a role to play to encourage others to come up. We have just in Nigeria done the charity legislation, charity bill, so that we begin to, to do what they do in America and other places, encouraging, encouraging people who are in doubt to look into that area. And, Government also provides certain incentives that will make people you know, look into, into, into charity area. And we're exporting this to other African countries too. I have to add something because I'm on the advisory board of the <laughs> Illamillo Foundation, so I have to brag about Tony a little bit more. I think that it really is quite significant. This is a major foundation that is funded by an African and the only one of its kind. And so it really is changing the game where you have Africans funding African charitable activities, not foreign donors. And just yesterday, there was an announcement from the foundation um, with respect to the Blair Elumelo Fellows in C Sierra Leone. And so just to make sure everyone gets the flows correctly, Tony Elumelo is funding the Tony Blair Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> to provide guidance to the president of Sierra Leone. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. This gentleman in the second row, please. Thank you. I'm Victor Lawrence. They're going to throw you a mic so that everybody can hear you. <laughs> there, it's coming down on your right side. Thank you. I'm Victor Lawrence, a Professor Stevens, and also chairman of Bahari Home Development Corporation, which is the, uh, uh, something that was set up by the African uh, uh, Union. I just, uh, Ambassador, uh, you may remember Africa One, mm -hmm. uh, where we work together. I, I remember. I, I do indeed. With you. And uh, the dream of Africa One is coming now. Yeah. And there are a lot of cables now along the west coast of Africa, and there are some on the east. And there is, I just want to mention about this public private partnership. Because when, you, when people started building cables along the coast of Africa, <coughs> they just started going to the most profitable parts. And they left a lot of countries like Liberia, 
Serelon, Gambia, Guinea Conakry, and I can go on. There are about seven countries which has never had a submarine cable. But the uh, African Union insisted and formed this Paharicom Corporation and insisted that they should have this uh, submarine cable. So today, in fact, there's, there's uh, Gambia. The cable has landed in Gambia and it's on its way through to Sao Tome and then eventually to Cape Town. So that's the usefulness of uh, public-private uh, cooperation. But I also wanted to say this, that the French are doing a very good job in Africa. And I think that perhaps, do you think that the Europeans and the Americans should come together and be able to work on joint projects? Because if you look at telecoms, the uh, French own more properties in Africa than any other uh, 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 country, not even uh, India. Well, Bharti Airtel has a few properties. Use the mic. Bharti Airtel has a few properties. But the French have their orange, and I can name it coming down from maybe Morocco all the way down to, to uh, Gambia and uh, Japan. Need a question out of here. Yeah. yeah. My question is that should the is a professor. I'm going to get fired. Is yes. a professor. <laughs> should the U.S. and the Europeans get together in order to look and tackle the problems? Very, very good question. So we talked about public-private partnerships, but we're talking about uh, international partnerships. One of our partners in a project we're doing in Tanzania is Arriva. It's now Alstom, but it was Arriva, <clears throat> with whom we worked in Iraq. So we actually do, um, uh, and we bid on another project in, um, in Tanzania with a Norwegian company that builds um, submarine lines, submarine cables. So we, 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 um, uh, we actively seek out both local partners um, and other international, either providers or partners. Um, and um, we actively look for possible PPPs as well. In fact, we're looking at one in the south of Tanzania and one in the east of Tanzania, and the one in the east of Tanzania might be a biomass renewable energy project, if we can nail that down. That'll supply, uh, supply energy to Kigoma along Lake Tanganyika for about one-third or one-fourth the cost that they have to pay for it now. It's very exciting. Second row from the back. Yeah, you. Grab the mic. Just, I know it sounds like everybody can hear, but just a little clearer. Thank you. I just want to ask a question. Um, the first question is, and it's more a more general question than the discussion has been so far, which is, what are the pluses and minuses or the, the benefits and pitfalls of talking about Africa as if it's one country when it's, I think, 52 or 53 different countries? Um, and I say that because I think as the American perspective is somehow, not is a little bit that it's one thing, um, and yet, if you try and look at it 52 or 53 different entities, sometimes I feel as if Africans themselves kind of also see themselves as members of a specific country and yet also part of Africa as one entity in a way. So I'm interested in that. And then the second thing is we've talked about it a little bit, but I'd be interested if there's anything more to say about the idea of, you know, China has been very good with its development in making its development Chinese um, and sort of put, putting themselves up to scale. And I'd be interested in more um, examples or conversations you might want to add about examples of African countries embracing development and getting themselves kind of up the value-added curve, for lack of a better term. I think that the, the, the generality of that question is excellent. And, and you know, we've referred to the McKinsey reports and we've referred to this high economic growth. Let me just give you a couple of examples, because I agree with you. It's always tricky to refer to Africa. There, there's very little of the rest of the world that we do that with. But, but let me just give you the similarities in Africa. This is just economic growth, GDP growth, estimates for 2012. South Africa, which is one of the laggards in the group, 2.5%. That's about what the U.S. will do, probably. Nigeria, 6.9%. Ghana, 7.3%. Angola, 10.8%. Algeria, another laggard, 3.3%. Botswana, 5.3% economic growth. Cameroon, 4.5%. Rwanda, 6.8%. That's down from 2011. Tanzania, 6.1%. Uganda, 5.2%. Cote d'Ivoire, 8.5%, up from negative 6% because it was a civil war raging country. Mozambique, 7.5%. Kenya, again, to my fellow Kenyans, a country that often gets it more wrong than right, 6.1%. Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, which is a bit of a mess of a country, 
3.1%. Zimbabwe will have greater economic growth than the United States will. So the one similarity about Africa, not on an absolute level, obviously, but um, the, the one similarity with a lot of Africa is it really, there? This, this is common. This, uh, with some exceptions, Africa really is growing. Yeah. I'll say a word about it. I think that an informed view of Africa as one monolithic entity can be helpful because it then starts to matter. When you can speak about a population of a billion, it puts it into perspective. And per particularly from an investment perspective, you can start to think on terms with India and China. I think that we sometimes are loath to think about Africa as one entity because of all the ignorance that is often associated with it. But there are 50 states, and some might say that there's a tremendous amount of variability. I mean, this gentleman flew in from California and hence doesn't feel appropriately dressed in the state of New York. Uh, <laughs> And so there are tremendous differences in our 50 states as there are differences in Africa. And that might be understating it a bit. We all speak the same language in the United States, and there's a lot that does bind us. But I do think that just as the United States has been able to take advantage of the strength of having a f 50 different entities come together for one trading entity, I think that there's a commercial argument as to why Africa should be thought of as Africa. Especially now that they're able to, uh, you know, we're getting better, Tony, at moving goods between African yeah. countries. I think uh, I'd like to just support uh, what Theresa said. It's, uh, for Africa, I think, I think personally, it's better to see Africa as an entity, one entity, than to see Africa as 50 different states. So take, for instance, the engagement with China, Africa and China. I think Africa as a continent, or one body negotiating with China, will produce better results for China and Africa mm -hmm. than it is today. Africa, China deals with different countries in Africa. I think it would be better if all were to come together and negotiate and say, for Africa, we need rail, we need this, you know, easier than what we see today. So I see, in addition to what Theresa said, to me is more, I say more pluses than the negatives. Wow, all right, we're gonna try and get as many questions as we can. This gentleman in the second row here, please. He's bringing you a mic right over your right shoulder. Excellent questions, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Razi, I'm from UNICEF. Um, I'm one of the, these many African youth living outside the continent and working hard, improving the lives by home. Um, I have a question for you. We've been talking a lot about countries like South Africa, Botswana, um, they are doing quite well. Um, as an African, I have a feeling that they don't really represent the whole continent. Of course, many of these countries have um, natural resources, Nigeria, Angola, um, you know, Botswana, Botswana, they don't really represent um, like Nigeria or Chad. Of course, you know, investors, you know, always want to invest in, in countries that don't have much resources, but at least they are stable. So um, I'm wondering about something. Is, is there, some, is there um, a condition that I call a sexy country where investors are much more interested in countries that where they see much more benefit, which of course is what is expected. What about countries like Mali, where there's great human resources, not much um, 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 natural resources, but stability, a desire of improvement and development? Agriculture. What do we do about these countries? Cotton. How do we invest? How do we develop these infrastructures and get them towards uh, development? At the end of the day, Africa doesn't move like other parts of the, of the world. One, one country needs other country. Africa cannot make it to Mali, or Nigeria cannot make it to Ghana. What do you think about now when we find them pretty much, you know? Okay, we got it. It's a good question. I just got to get you an answer before I get thrown out. Very, very, very interesting point. I like the sexy country index idea. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, the point is African leaders have a challenge. You know, the attractiveness of countries depend to a large extent on our local leadership. And that is, I use, I don't want to say government alone, it's, I see it as private sector leadership and government, working together to create the attractive and enabling environment that will make investors come into those countries. We can't sit here and legislate and tell people, don't go to South Africa or Botswana, go to Mali. But people will go to Mali if they think that Mali is a good destination for business. And Mali does have certain endowments also. Okay, so 
if you look at Rwanda today, Rwanda does not have the kind of resources other countries, even Mali has. But people are ready to go to Rwanda to do business. So the challenge for our leadership is to create the right environment for people to come to invest in our country. I think uh, that, that will help. And what's sexy for us is if the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation is going to do a compact because they hold countries to certain standards of, of uh, performance, both in the, in the macroeconomic and the political and the transparency and rule of law sphere. And then when they're prepared to make a $400 million investment in the infrastructure of a country, we're prepared to go in after them, try and get some of that contract business and use that as a platform from which to expand and diversify our business. So that's the model we use in Tanzania. We went in uh, with, uh, following the contracts and we ended up owning, um, what, uh, it'll be up to 600 megawatts if, if we, by the end of the 2013. I have to just a sexy oh, sure. question too though. Um, and I think that you know, it's a very good analogy because you know, some countries are born sexy and some have to make themselves sexy. And, <laughs> and I think... Good way to put it. And, uh, and, and, like so many of us. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that those that have a large population like Nigeria, that's an you know, obvious big market just as the United States, California, and New York are naturally sexy markets because of the size. I think that you can be a sexy country because you're coastal or because you have resources. Or you could be like Singapore and Taiwan and Hong Kong and figure out how to develop policies. You don't have a large population, you don't have large natural resources, but you can make yourself sexy by creating investment policies that attract capital. Yeah, I think that's well put. I was born sexy. This gentleman <laughs> over here. Uh, hi, I'm Charles McLean. I work for a company that, a um, uh, communications company. We have an office in Nairobi. I wanted to circle back to something that you said earlier, Ms. Clark. Uh, about uh, Kenya being the Silicon Valley of, of Africa. And, and talk, if you could on the panel, talk for a minute about education, because I think people who are looking to make investments in Africa are impressed by the, the improvements in infrastructure, for example. They're impressed by a lot of the things that have been cited by this panel. But education seems to be a big issue. Who's doing it right? Who's doing it well? And are there models that could be followed you know, throughout oh. Africa? Thank you for asking the question because it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, having founded an education nonprofit in South Africa. Um, I think you may have seen there was an article in this last Sunday's New York Times by Tom Friedman saying, forget the, uh, forget the oil, give us books, which really may underscored the point that you were making, that education is the best investment, the best natural resource. And if you look at India, for example, today, as an emerging market that has been able to figure out how to engage with the rest of the world. If you didn't have an educated population that spoke English, they couldn't have gotten started with the outsourcing, um, becoming the engineering um, capital of the world that it has become. And so I think that India is a great example of how education, and I say that because I also understand India enough to know that there are still huge problems in the Indian population. Not everyone is well educated, and there are some tracks that are and some that aren't. But for those who are, it has provided a catalyst um, in order to help that country's economic engine develop and evolve. Um, within Africa, which is your question, I don't know that I am qualified to answer the question on a macro level around the continent, but I could just um, point out some points of light around the continent. Um, there is the Africa Leadership Academy in South Africa, which is doing a fantastic job. They have created a very pan-African curriculum and a, a very African student body. And they are, you know, they just graduated their first class of graduates, and it's a list of colleges that anybody in this room would be proud to um, you know, say you know, where their kids had gone. Um, you have Ashehi University in Ghana, which is, uh, was founded by a former Microsoft uh, executive, and they have really been um, bringing high-tech executives to come and guest lecture and be um, visiting lecturers. And so you see that's a wonderful development of a new university in, um, in, in Ghana. So I think that there are various pockets of optimism. Um, I think that public education in general across the continent needs a lot more investment. I know South Africa better than the rest of the continent, and I can tell you, having been close to that sector over the last decade, that public education in South Africa today, um, many argue, is worse than it was during the apartheid years, which is really hard to imagine, but true. On the other hand, you see 
that um, money buys you access, and in South Africa you now have a more integrated private school sector than you had during the apartheid years. So the middle class is getting better education, but from the public perspective, the standards have declined. Let, let, sorry, let me sure. come in. From a slightly different perspective, you know, the existence of uh, what I call institutional rigidities should not be a hindrance for business. What's important is how do you overcome that institutional rigidity? So in Africa, for instance, education or qualified manpower could be a hindrance, or could be, but companies have devised means to deal with this issue. So I take the case of us, UBA, United Bank for Africa, was CEO of UBA for 13 and a half years, and we have presence in 20 African countries beyond Nigeria. And so what did we do? We set up UBA Academy. So UBA Academy is like UBA University, and we recruit people. They spend like six months in UBA Academy, and we retrain them and post them to different countries. And so we recruit from different countries in Africa, train them, and send them to different countries. And through that, we've been able to have about 25,000 workers, and we train them through this process. So for me, and we learned this from the Japanese, they, they, when they were growing, they, they went through this kind of challenge, difficult times. What's important is realize, identify that there's a problem, and see how you can fix that problem. And that will give you a competitive edge, because other businesses will not easily replicate or have that edge, and so you can move faster than, than them. So in Africa, yeah, it does exist, but companies like UBA, United Bank of Africa, have found out to deal with this issue. Sadly, I have to end this. Uh, what a great, great conversation it's been. What great, uh, thoughtful questions you've all had. I want to thank you for attending this. I want to thank our, uh, our panel, Teresa Clark, Tony Alumello, and uh, Ambassador Joseph Wilson. Thanks so much for your, uh, your great insights and, and for sharing them with our audience. Thank you.